A human being can encourage himself, give himself orders, obey, blame and punish himself. He can ask himself a question and answer it. We could even imagine human beings who spoke only in monologue, who accompanied their activities by talking to themselves. An explorer who watched them and listened to their talk might succeed in translating their language into ours. This would enable him to predict these people's actions correctly, for he also hears them making resolutions and decisions. But could we also imagine a language in which a person could write down or give vocal expression to his inner experiences, his feelings, moods and the rest, for his private use? Well, can't we do so in our ordinary language? But that is not what I mean. The individual words of this language are to refer to what can only be known to the person speaking, to his immediate private sensations. So another person cannot understand the language. So that's taken to be the kind of initial remark in this sequence of remarks that we're calling the private language argument. So one crucial thing here is that the notion of privacy that Wittgenstein's working with is not the ordinary everyday familiar notion of privacy. That's the notion that he refers to when the interlocutor in this dialogue says, you know, can't we perfectly well write down and give vocal expression to our inner experiences for private use? We can keep diaries, we can keep records of various kinds that we, you know, go up to our bedrooms every night and fill in and don't let anybody else see, put a lock on the diary. But of course, anything in that kind of diary could in principle be shared with other people. So that kind of privacy, you might say, is contingent right? It's what not it, entirely private. Exactly, right. So, so the interlocutor brings out the idea that that's not the kind of privacy he's really interested in or fascinated by. He's interested in a possibility of what you might call logical or metaphysical privacy, where it's not possible, it's not conceivable to imagine your inner experience being capable of being communicated to anybody else. You have a perfect, transparent grasp of it, but by definition, anyone who isn't in the position to have those experiences can't possibly make head or tail of what it is that you're going through. Dennis, do you want to come in? How, how do you take the private language argument? Well, I think as, as Stephen says, there's this, this key idea of privacy or of interiority or however you might put it, which to link to, if, if you like, a broader issues within, within philosophy, there are well-established tendencies within philosophy since Descartes to think of the mind as in some, as in some way um, self-contained, set back from behavioural manifestations, the set back from the, the life of the body in, in some respects. So philosophers have developed for themselves this sense um, of the mind as this distinctive interior space. Um, to which the owner of that mind, if you like, has what gets referred to as privileged access. They have this special form of knowledge um, of that, that inner space. And it's so special that it can rather embarrass any other kind of knowledge claims because claims to know anything beyond the mind start looking distinctly um, iffy uh, because they, they don't have the, that special quality that, the, the, that claims about your own um, interior little inner theatre have. And these forms of scepticism have kind of haunted philosophy, um, certainly since since Descartes. And Mill gives a, a is, is one of the, the early great statements. It's not that early, I suppose, um, of other mind scepticism. So if it should turn out that this vision of the inner is suspect, then the promise again is this: you know that we might actually exercise some of these ghosts. His worry is whether we can make any coherent sense of this idea of a sort of absolute or logical privacy um, and if not what that says about us in effect you know the way we understand ourselves the way we interpret ourselves and there are I think probably there are kind of three main points where he's trying to work out what's problematic about this kind of modern intuition of, of privacy and it's quite often familiar to draw a distinction between what gets called epistemic privacy and privacy of ownership. So Wittgenstein suggests that there are kind of two interrelated ideas that go to make up this idea of, of, of privacy. And one has to do with who knows what, who has the authority with respect to these phenomena, um, and what the gap is in terms of epistemology, in other words, in terms of knowledge, doubt, and certainty between a third person perspective on my pain and my own perspective 
uh, on my pain. And the other one is the idea of, as it were, who owns the pains, whose they are who they belong to. And I think actually that second idea really does pick up on a certain culturally specific modern notion of what it is to be a kind of autonomous individual. You know, mm. if you don't own your own experience in a kind of modern capitalist world, then something's going seriously wrong. You know, the idea of self-ownership has all kinds of cultural ramifications beyond this, but yeah. this is a central part of it, that if it's your emotion or if it's your feeling nobody else can have what you have it's a kind of metaphysically private property yeah it's one have. of the tricks of his writing that he almost seduces you with an idea the idea of a private language that seems very alluring and real to you but then there's an argument that was refuting the possibility of that okay so this is um section 258 of the investigations so he says let us imagine the following case i want to keep a diary about the recurrence of a certain sensation to this end i associated with the sign S, it's in quotes, I'm doing invisible quotes for the radio listener, um, S, and writes this sign in a calendar for every day on which I have the sensation. I remark, first of all, that a definition of the sign cannot be formulated. But still, I can give myself a kind of ostensive definition, surely. You know, this is the, these are the voices that, uh, that Stephen talked about, this kind of conversation. Anyway, back to Wittgenstein. Um, still, I can give myself a, a kind of ostensive definition. How? Can I point to the sensation? Well, not in the ordinary sense. But I speak or write the sign down, and at the same time, I concentrate my attention on the sensation. And so, as it were, point to it inwardly. But what is this ceremony for? For that is all it seems to be. A definition surely serves to establish the meaning of a sign. Well, that's done precisely by the concentrating of my attention. For in this way, I impress on myself the connection between the sign and the sensation. I impress it on myself can only mean this process brings it about that I remember the connection right in the future. But in the present case, I have no criterion of correctness. One would like to say whatever is going to seem right to me is right. And that only means that here we can't talk about right again in quotes. So what he seems to be doing here is he's, he's kind of saying to the, you know, the, the philosopher of this kind of interiority, you imagine yourself being able to describe the contents of this of this mind conceived in the way that, that you do. Um, in order to be able to describe the contents of your minds, you're going to have to have concepts that you can use to describe it. You're going to have to establish some kind of system of categories and classifications, if you like, and to, to, in order to say, ah, yes, here's sensation S or here's sensation T. But what Wittgenstein seems to be saying, doing there, is saying, okay, um, how is that meant to work then? Talk, talk me through how this is actually meant to work. How do you establish the system of concepts which you're going to draw upon in, 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 in constructing these, these descriptions? Quite what happens in that passage is something which I trust we will have a little bit of a conversation about. Um, the upshot of it seems to be they can't fix these concepts. They can't give the concepts that they will use to describe this, this distinctive inner life, they can't give them content. So they can't give them a determinate, if I go back to the language of language, you know, talking about S, they can't give S a determinate meaning. That seems to be what he's arguing in this, in this key passage. He's saying, look, we have this very, very general tendency, a tendency that the author of the Tractatus seemed also to exemplify, to think that a basic relationship between words and reality is one of naming or referring, picking out objects, denoting them. And that's what we tend to think when we think about the word pain. We think that what's happening when we use the word is that we pick out an object. It's just that this object is metaphysically private. Right? And the worry here is that you, you really shouldn't underestimate the scale of the task that the diarist is taking on. Right? If he's right about the nature of our interior life, then everything in our psychological vocabulary about our mind and our moods and our emotions will have to be set up and stabilized and deployed only by him, right? This really is a, a logically private language. And what Wittgenstein is saying in 258 is that the moment you think that you need to define the meanings of the words you're going to use to keep track of your sensations, you have to set up a standard of correctness for future use of those words. And what Wittgenstein is trying to show is that that would only be 
set up, you could only set that up successfully if it was possible for you when you meet a future candidate sensation to remember the original sensation that you associated the sign S with. But in order to be able to do that, you have to be able to distinguish memories of S from memories of T or U or V. But if you were capable of distinguishing S memories from T memories, then you must already know what the meaning of the word S is in order to be able to use correctly phrases like S memories. So in short, on the one hand, it's only if you can identify the memory correctly that you've conferred a meaning on the word. But in order to identify the meaning correctly, you must already have conferred meaning on the word. So this is 293, section 293 in the book. So he says, suppose everyone had a box with something in it. We call it a beetle. No one can look into anyone else's box. And everyone says he knows what a beetle is only by looking at his beetle. Here, it'd be quite possible for everyone to have something different in his box. One might even imagine such a thing constantly changing. But suppose the word beetle had a use in these people's language. If so, it wouldn't be used as the name of a thing. The thing in the box has no place in the language game at all, not even as a something, for the box might even be empty. No, one can divide through by the thing in the box. It cancels out whatever it is. And then he draws the moral. If we construe the grammar of the expression of sensation on the model of object and designation, the object drops out of consideration as irrelevant. And in a certain sense, this is exactly the focus of the 258 passage about keeping the diary. There's exactly the same underlying picture that Wittgenstein's trying to bring out and, and criticize. So what he's doing with the beetle in the box example is saying, well, look, let's take that picture seriously, right? If it really were the case that we should think about the word pain and the phenomenon pain on the model of object and name, well, what would it actually be like? And the example of the beetle in the box really objectifies pain, right? So, so think about it as a kind of thing in a container where the container is your body, right? If you have a use for the word that you think names something in that box, whatever kind of use it could have, it couldn't be a naming use. It couldn't be a label for an entity that's inside the box. Because if that were the case, you could end up with a situation where there was absolutely nothing in anyone's box. In other words, the functioning of the language and the metaphysical picture of what it's referring to just fall apart. And that, I think, just to go back to 258, is what's usually taken to be driving the anxiety about whether or not there could be a way of keeping note of your sensations if those sensations were metaphysically private. I mean, this in a way, this is going to get us into the, the issues about exactly how we should understand these passages. I guess I would just mention one, one other way of thinking about what might be going on in, in, that, in that passage, which is to say that even if you could, if you like, get that sample back, that original sample, just suppose for the, the sake of argument, you do find yourself once again looking at that original sample that you use to try and specify what, what you mean by S. It doesn't seem to be able to perform the explanatory role that we think it does. So anyway, to go back to the to the, the Beetle case, in, in both cases, the thing that we think is going to make all the difference can't make the difference we want it to make. So in the case of the sample, you might, you know, suppose you do recover that original sample of, of S and you say, okay, so that is what I meant by S. But of course, that sample might be, say it's a sample of, um, you know, a yellow sensation. You might say, ah, right, okay, so it meant yellow. But then that sensation is also maybe a bright yellow. Or maybe it was a sensation that you had at a particular time, uh, or perhaps it was caused in a particular way. And just getting the sample back doesn't tell you, if you like, what it was about this sample that you were picking out as fixing the meaning of these terms. You know, there's, a, there's all this debate about exactly how these arguments are meant to work. But another possible thought that might have some part to play here is that um, the sample can't do the job because as where the sample just sits there, um, describable in multiple ways, and will not tell you how it should be described. So the, this notion that, if you like, the sample will fix the concept, well, unfortunately, the sample can't fix the concept because it instantiates too many concepts. Um, so again, this, this hope on the part of this kind of philosopher of interiority, that they've got this inner realm, that then they've got these concepts using which they can 
uh, describe it. Wittgenstein is prodding them and saying, OK, so talk us through how that's supposed to work. And one of the things that seems to be happening in these passages is that the, the explanations that, that they, if you like, assume they have at the back of their minds for how these things are meant to work turn out to, to not deliver. They, they can't really make sense of some of these structures that they've been relying upon.